Next case, and we haven't had a discussion about this uh, for a while, uh, is a 52-year-old male, and um, I really want some advice on this, uh, progressive limp abdominal lymphadenopathy. In 2013, he presented with cramping and sharp abdominal pain and a CT scan revealed mild adenopathy. In December, on December 31st of 2014, he had abdominal cramping and distension. He had an obstruction, and so on January 4th, he underwent an exploratory lap, and an 8.5 by 6.2 by 1.3 centimeter mass was resected. He came for a second opinion on February 3rd of 2015, and I've followed him since. He was uh, in, uh, randomized on Steve's uh, precog 0401 trial on March 3rd of 2015 to rituximab weekly times four. He had a negative pet after that. Uh, he was very uh, physically active. Uh, uh, and on May 31st of 2017, he had a superior mesenteric node that was 3.6 by 3.4 centimeters. And I don't mean to take anything away from radiology. Usually I don't put these numbers up and don't want us to do this, but I think it's an interesting way to watch and think about this guy, and we'll see the actual pictures. But this, uh, by March 6th of 2018, 3.8 by 4.1 centimeters. In October uh, 29, 2019, we'll see what the numbers look like, uh, but there's progressive lymphadenopathy. His past medical and surgical history are unremarkable. He's a non-smoker. <coughs> His exam was unremarkable. His laboratory studies were unremarkable. His ratio ALC AMC was 3.4, which was a good thing in his absolute monocyte count is 470, uh, which is a good thing. Could we see the radiology, please? So this was the original initial, initial presenting CT from 2015, showing this because I think there's a recurrent theme. I clearly had a bowel obstruction in that 8 centimeter mass that was resected must have been um, the bowel because there wasn't a true soft tissue mass on this outside CT. So it's probably the bowel loop, I would suspect. But clearly a bowel obstruction. The only other pertinent finding on this initial CT was some mid-mesenteric adenopathy, adenopathy with some misty mesentery appearance around it. And it's from that resection that the diagnosis of lymphoma was made. After resection had uh, his initial staging PET, and there was at this time just uh, some mesenteric lymphadenopathy measuring up to 1.8 centimeter with an SUV max of 3.8, so low grade. Um, no apparent bowel involvement at this time post resection, but you know, bowel has physiologic activity in it normally, so that can be hard to see, um, but no apparent bowel, bowel involvement at that time. Patient was treated, as mentioned, had a complete metabolic response by June of 2015, was observed, and uh, later on in 2015 had some nodal recurrence here in the mesentery, small again, SUV max 2.8. Question was raised, was there bowel involvement at this point? This is near this node in the loop of bowel. I don't know if this panned out. Again, bowel, act there can be normal physiologic bowel activity, and this is around a bowel anastomosis as well, so it could be a combination of physiologic and reactive to the suture. And at this point, uh, surveillance was changed to CT scans, uh, no longer doing PETs. And you can see the adenopathy has been increasing now up to 3.6 centimeters in the mid mesentery. It was mentioned on this uh, CT that had oral enteric contrast that there was an abnormal thickened loop of small bowel in the right lower quadrant. And later on in April of 2018, the patient again presented with small bowel obstruction. And uh, just zooming in on this loop down here, that was read as abnormal, concerning for possible lymphoma involvement. And if we look on, this is his obstruction CT um, from the outside again. I, I think this is the tapering loop where the obstruction occurred, and it's hard to say for sure it's the same loop, but it's in a very similar position, so it's probably corresponding. And then again, additional CT follow-up later on, the adenopathy is increased again up to 4.8 centimeters with some new sites developing lower down in the mesentery as well. So may we see the pathology, please? All right. So in contrast to the last case, we have lots of tissue here. So this was the small bowel resection um, that was taken um, in 2015. And you can see a little bit of bowel mucosa at the surface here um, and a very impressive um, nodular lymphoid infiltrate throughout the mucosa, extending, as you can see here, through the muscularis. 
um, and into the um, serosal fat, um, as you can appreciate here. Um, and if you've ever seen a textbook picture of follicular lymphoma, this would look pretty good for it. It's nodular. Um, if we go and look um, at higher power, the cells are predominantly small. Um, as you can see here, and so consistent with um, a low-grade process, of course, we always phenotype it, um, even when the morphology is classic like this. Um, so this is CD20, and you can see CD20 really highlights um, those abnormal follicles. They are also positive for CD10, as you can see here, confirming that these are germinal centers and they show abnormal expression of BCL2, which you can see here. Um, the stains are a bit old, it's not the best um, here, but you can see definitely BCL2 positive, which is abnormal for germinal centers. This was diagnosed as follicular lymphoma grade 1-2. So the question is, what should we do now? You know, I think we have a few minutes, so I'm gonna just frame this um, for a few minutes and kind of the way of come to think of this. We have Matt Maurer with us today, uh, also who's been key to a lot of the observations we've made and, uh, and, and from a statistical perspective. So the absolute monocyte count was favorable. It was less than 570, and you can appreciate the overall survival of not reach versus 10.2 years in the uh, work Steve was involved in. Uh, in the monoclonal antibody era, and uh, we were the first to report out of the MER that if you, the, the observation of the transformation at five years was highest in patients who were observed and lowest who initially received rituximab. So we've kind of taken away that risk factor in him. He was randomized to rituximab, so the data would look a lot like the resort trial. And the uh, uh, Patients initially received uh, upfront rituximab 375 per meter squared, then were uh, uh, randomized to retreatment versus observation, and there were no differences there. The Matt was the first author on an, a paper on the early event status, and patients who achieved an EFS 12 had no added mortality beyond the, the background population. And that, is an interesting and important observation was validated by a series of 412 patients from France. And this was the survival curve of those who received rituximab monotherapy. And the uh, uh, you can appreciate the darker colors are the uh, MER survival and the expected MER survival and the Lyon and expected are in red. And those are very different than if you got immunochemotherapy uh, and you failed. If you got immunochemotherapy and failed, these, this, is a, this is the bad subtype of this, of this disease. And I think a really neat paper, uh, I really like this paper, uh, the cause of death in follicular lymphoma. And I think I actually brought this out in front of a patient yesterday um, because he's sitting there at four years out, and he said, what are my chances? And he's 79 years old. Well, here we've got a, a younger patient who's 52 years old. And uh, so what can we begin to tell them uh, in, in data out of the immunochemotherapy era? And basically, the bottom line is that the cumulative incidence of death from lymphoma at 10 years was 10%. And there's a difference in age groups. So this our patient we're talking about today uh, this is what the survival curves look like, and if you're over 70, then the lymphoma specifics uh, 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 related uh, uh, deaths are, are much higher at 30% in blue. And then I think the, the critical piece of this is that uh, lymphoma was the number one cause of death but half of those essentially were from transformation. So if we're really gonna make a big dent in this, we've got to do something in that disease, but we've already taken away some of his risk for that. Um, Tom was involved in mentoring uh, uh, a, a resident who did a really cool paper on PET scans 
And in multivariate analysis, using the premium PI factors, the number of extranodal sites was an independent prognostic factor. We haven't petted him along the way, but initially he had none of that. So he didn't fit in a, in a bad subgroup there. So I'm not going to go through and iterate what the options are, but I'll open it up for discussions and uh, recommendations to how what I should do now. Dr. Witzig. Yeah, I, so so you, you're basically relapsed at asymptomatic? Because he's basically. asymptomatic, yeah. Oh. And he's, he, he's essentially been, he had a one minor small bowel obstruction. We saw the uh, that slide, but that had not recurred. Um, 52, first relapse after rituxin, asymptomatic. Yeah, and he's been progressive. He's, he, he's, he's relapsed, but he's had just a progressive increase in the lymphadenopathy. No, but no symptoms? No symptoms. So you're just you're just scanning him all the time? I'm ending up scanning him about once a year. Well, you've got a lot of options. And how long between the last two? He was last treated uh, 2015, so 2015, five years. Yeah. March 3rd, 2015. So five years out, asymptomatic, slowly growing disease. Uh, probably the worst thing that could happen to him is another bowel obstruction, to be honest with you. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's what I would worry about the most. Yeah. So you could, and he's now 52, go back to your, your multiple guest slide. <laughs> I've been doing this to Dr. Witzel since 1982. Told us five choices. Look at that. Seven choices. <laughs> I, I, I probably would consider number four. Just to give him a course of BR. He's only 52. He, if he was 82, I'd say you might be able to wait this out and die of something yeah. else. But he's young enough. He's clearly shown progression. So I might want to reboot, get him back in remission, and then you know hope he'd have a long another long uh, survival. Tom, remind me, he had a CR to uh, rituximab in the beginning? Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, you a, could do that. Too. Another option could be just to follow your resort strategy, and that is just retreat him with four doses of rituxan. You've got five years out of the first yeah. four doses. Um, I mean, BR is not a wrong option. It's just, you know, okay. you've got a lot of miles out of the first dose. Yeah. Someone they would consider Zeppelin. You could give him I think that's what you put. So I've been Otuzumab. Did you mean Opinutuzumab there? Yeah, I'm sorry. I misspelled. No. Oh, yeah. yeah, you it, don't it, have Zeppelin. I mean, it, he'd, be, he'd fit the criteria for radium and therapy. Now he's got bowel involvement. You, I mean, any of these you're going to worry about perforating him when you treat him again. But, you know. <clears throat> what about uh, external beam radiation? Is going to be reasonable too? He relapsed locally. He has disease in the external site. The draining mechanics involved. So, if he had presented this way up front, you could make an argument that he's stage two and he's treated external beam. It's possible. I think the bottom line is there's not a right or wrong right. answer, yeah, Tom. Right. I think it's really just what the patient wants. And I think at the end of the day, also, whatever you do, whatever's going to give the least toxicity. Because, as you point out, he's 52. If you can get five to ten years out of something very mild yeah. that just uh, gives you another option for five to ten more years beyond that without limiting your side effects. Sparrow, any comments? Yeah, Tom, um, Dr. Karlovich, uh, we don't use anymore uh, so much uh, Zevalin or Bexar, uh, probably because we use more BR now. Um, would you consider, I don't see on your list, something, you know, level in, uh, in this patient, and would you be concerned with the, with the bowel uh, issues that he had used that, uh, that were treatment? Tom? Never, i never seen anybody perforate <clears throat> from Zevalin, but I, I, I think you'd have to be concerned about it, whatever you did, that that could happen. Um, it could happen without him, if you do nothing. With observation in a lot, it could right. you could obstruct or perforate. I've seen that happen. Um, I just think I agree with Steve. I, I don't really know that there's a right answer here. But it, what I'm, I guess, uh, or, uh, Dr. Levy, any comments from Middlesex? Not to pick on anyone, but I, I like the we like all the interaction. Well, uh, I would favor rituxan alone because I would be concerned about the risk of uh, bowel obstruction again. 
it's, it sounds like what I'm hearing is that observation, there's much support for tr treating him with something. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. Good. So I think we'll, I'll, I'll come back to him with that. Um, All right, let me ask you this. What would anybody give him the albumin tuzumab? Now, he'd have right toxin once. Should, do you think that offers any advantage other than a little more cost, probably? Well, there is one study in low-grade lymphomas in combination with chemotherapy that shows a progression-free and overall survival for the addition of venetuzumab. More infusion reactions, so one would need to weigh it up. I kind of get the sense that, in my mind, uh, it's a Coke and Pepsi discussion. <coughs> it's, you know, which, which do you like better, and everyone's got their preference. Um, I think the general efficacy is very similar, and I think it really just comes down to what you're comfortable. I think uh, what's given rituximab a bit of an edge again is the ability to give it subcutaneously if that impacts your practice, where venetuzumab doesn't have that. Do you, do you have to prove it's still CD20 positive? Does that matter to you? I'm sorry? Do you have to prove it's still CD20 positive? Does that matter? That's a great question, whether or not it's CD20 positive. I Normally, what I do before I retreat someone is, is I biopsy it. I mean, I just, and especially that we're five, you know, we're in that five year range out now. I think it's occasionally, as Dr. Colgan, who's not here and vacationing elsewhere outside the country this week, uh, says, I never regretted getting another piece of tissue. Um, and occasionally we get surprised, as we all know around the table. So I think I probably would, before I treat him, I just, we do a core needle and just make sure everybody's comfortable and then go. For the sake of imaging follow-up, the last couple of CTs were just abdomen, didn't include the pelvis, so that questionable loop of bowel wasn't actually included, so it might be worth doing like a CT enterography to distend the bowel and okay. adequately assess that loop. This is a normal CT, but they drink lots of uh, high-volume enteric contrast to distend the bowel. And yeah, for no, that's a good point. That's, that could also influence how we think. <laughs> 